Hello, Dr. Smith here. Welcome to the call. We're uh, at the top of the hour, so we'll go ahead and proceed. Uh, I would encourage members uh, that perhaps are here for the first time uh, to join on your screen so that you can actually see my screen as, as I attempt to illustrate uh, whatever uh, the requirements of the call may be, both in terms of orienting people to the back office or providing instructions uh, on the use of the reaction report and so forth. And the, the way that you enter uh, the conference call is simply by going to the webcast link located in your back office and click on Join Meeting. The, this call, uh, the, the format of the call as we move forward will be to take questions submitted on the uh, text input when you join the meeting, a little text thing is going to pop up, and you'll be able to put your questions in there. And then what I'll do is I'll go through the questions, and we'll begin to um, to knock those out. We may open the call up to have some dialogue back and forth with the, the, the specific uh, member that is submitting those questions. So um, with that in mind, uh, I'm going to give you just a second to to go into the back office and join the meeting by clicking on the join meeting link under the webcast tab located in the back office. So I'll just give you just a minute to do that. And those of you that may not may be only joining by phone, um, as occasion permits, we'll, we'll open the line and let you actually submit your questions over the line as we go on uh, with this system, I suspect that the numbers at some point will be substantial to where we may not have the option of opening the line up, uh, but, but taking uh, questions submitted and then we can, you know, have a discussion on those. Then we, we've tested both ways and it's most effective to take the questions submitted as a text input into the uh, the conferencing software. Okay, uh, I do not see anybody joining the back office. I think there's uh, probably only three of you on the line. So, is anybody having a problem doing yes, that? Yes, yes, Dwayne. Um, I'm logging in, and I keep on getting into account login, and can't seem to get past that. And yet, I've logged in before and just went straight in. Uh, this is the fourth attempt, and I'm still getting account login and not permitting me to get in. Okay. Um, who is this speaking? Louise. No, I'm not getting in. Uh, how do you spell your last name, Louise? M C D O U G A L L. Yeah, I knew it was McDougal. I just didn't know. I realized it was two uh, L's. That's why I wasn't getting in there. Okay. Um, I'm going to attempt. You have your username and password, right? Yes. Okay. I'm going to attempt to log in using your username and password and see if I have if I can replicate the uh, error. Okay. I was able to log in just fine. Hmm. Um, no, it's telling me invalid account. Yeah, uh, you you may be. Um, okay, let's try again. You may you may want to make sure that you're all lowercase that you don't that your that your cap lock is not on. Okay. And is anybody else having a hard, because I don't see, who, who are the other two callers on here? Uh, Elena for Vladimir. Okay, did, were you not able to log in? Uh, I don't have meeting? access to a computer right now, no. Okay, and who else? Uh, Sue, Sue I have phone from Atlanta and no access to a computer. Okay, Sue? Uh-huh. Are you in Atlanta? Yes, I am. Okay. 
and no access to a computer. Okay, so at least we've established that some of you are just on the call. Um, with with the small with the small call, we can entertain uh, you know questions verbally. But just so you know, as we have 20, 30, 50, 100 people on here, we'll have to mute the call, and you'll you'll be able to listen and probably gain almost as much as you would. Uh, you know, many of your questions are going to be answered by answering somebody else's question. Obviously, that's the the point of uh, you know the productivity of this type of call. Um, this this type of call is not intended to address personal case management issues. Those are uh, more effectively addressed by submitting your specific question into the back office mail system, uh, where we will respond to it. And if the need arises, that we that we call you if we determine that a call is needed, we can facilitate that as well. But most of those type of personal case management questions can be handled through the back office. Now, if it's a general question, for example, um, you know, how do I know when to get myself the next injection? Or I'm not understanding the dietary protocol. Or um, please, you know, review the pre-cleansing requirements of the Delta Diet Protocol with me. Something to that effect. Uh, how do I use the forum? Uh, why can't I, you know, I'm having a problem uh, with my email or whatever the case is. Those are examples of general questions. So, uh, Louise, were you able to get in? No, I'm sorry. I still can't. I'll keep trying. Yeah, uh, I, I was able to log in, um, and you probably want to make sure that you're you're typing your first uh, letter and then your last name and then your password. Yes. Okay. Uh, you can al alternately, if you if you cannot get into your account, because I don't know why you can't get in, because you've been in. I've seen your reports for the last week, uh, so you mm -hmm. obviously have been logging in. But if you have a, a problem, um, you can send an email to go to delta at gmail dot com. Then we'll uh, problem shoot it, and a member of our staff will contact you. Make sure we get that worked out. Thank you. Okay. So why don't we uh, – uh, I have Kathy uh, that has joined us uh, on the screen sharing mode, so we'll, we'll go ahead and – and Franco. So why don't we start with those. That, those are our default uh, questions. We go to those questions first that are joining via the back office, uh, beginning with Kathy. If you want to submit uh, – start submitting your questions into the text, and I can address those, and, and then we can – you know, uh, uh, communicate back and forth on those. We like to have them submitted as a text because it also allows us to record uh, exactly what the question is in the event that we need to do further research on behalf of the member or we need to, you know, maybe it's beyond the scope of the call and, uh, and then we can have a reference point for following up with the member to make sure that uh, their, their needs are satisfied uh, with respect to, you know, particular case management questions or things of that nature. So go ahead and feel free to submit those, uh, Kathy and Franco, in the uh, text area if you have questions. If not, I'm going to open, uh, open it up to you, Louise, first, and then we're going to kind of move through uh, our membership. Uh, so let me go ahead and open it open up to you. What are your immediate – this is the first time, I think, on this call. So, and in, in, in by the way, let me just throw this out there. Uh, very shortly here, maybe even as uh, uh, soon as the end of the week, we will have a new video called New Member Orientation Video. This video will cover really the entire program from A to Z, uh, including such things as, just to give you a, a, a basic idea, uh, you know the point of contract, the point of contact through the registration process, uh, shipping and fulfillment. When you receive your, you know, package, what's in the package, how to hook everything up, uh, what to do with your injection when you get it, uh, how to, you know, pursue the the, the pre-cleanse stage, how to administer the BX antitoxin in terms of, you know, uh, understanding agitating the bottle, filling the syringe, what is an intramuscular injection, how is that uh, performed, um, 
these types of, of things are going to be covered in great deal, detail. Uh, the dosage, a recording in the back office, the dosage, how to understand and determine subsequent administrations, uh, long-term case management issues, understanding the, the negative cycles that result from the use of the uh, the uh, BX molecule, uh, and so a lot of these things are going to be covered in that new video. That'll be a, a great place for, like you, you, Louise, you know, when you write, even before you go to a clinical affiliate, for example, you'll have that video along with the, the back office, making the most of your back office video that'll be revised to include the new reaction report section. Uh, that'll give you a big head start in getting kind of a a bird's eye view of what the program is from beginning to end, and I think that'll be quite helpful. But in the meantime, that's the purpose of this call. So, Louise, with that said, uh, what what can we help you with? And what okay. questions uh, do you have? Good. <laughs> okay, well, I think that information that you're going to be sending out will be very, very helpful, so thank you for that. Um, Okay, I'm um, I'm starting to you know put some information in the back office, which is good, and uh, I just got some results this morning, so I was going to enter them in this morning, but I can't get in yet, so I'll wait a little bit. Um, uh, what I didn't see yesterday was I was trying to add my meals, and then I thought, okay, I'll go back uh, this morning. I'll go back and do my my dinner from last night, but I, I can't go back to that. So will there be, a, a, you know, where we can scroll back and dates to put in our uh, our medical info and our test results and all that? Will we be able to do that for other things as well, like the meals, or maybe I'm just not catching on on how to do that? Oh, on the on the backdating on the meals. Yeah. Yeah, that that will also be a function that's uh, forthcoming. Um, the the priority right now is the reaction report. Uh, the, the backdating on the mills and, and the mine for health and these things are not uh, quite as critical, but they, yes, those, those areas will be resolved so that you're able to backdate those as well. Um, you, you notice that there's nutrition and diet, mine for health, exercise, yeah. and other daily activities. Right now, uh, we haven't updated the backdating capability, but that is, that is coming. Don't let that stress you out too much because those aren't priority categories. Those are more for your own journaling capabilities. Uh, right now, the key is is the reaction report, which you'll notice has been fully updated to include the ability to generate reports in specific areas and also to show prior reactions. Uh, you'll notice that it says, uh, please choose the range. And simply, you know, if you want to uh, to generate a range, let's say for the last week, beginning on, you know, the 13th through the 17th, you just put that date range in there, click on show reaction, and you'll notice that your reaction details will be listed directly under the, under the report. Uh, also important is messages from the administrator. If you do backdate and generate a range view so that you can see your reports that you submitted over the last week, sometimes people will submit their reports at night and then not go back to the prior day to see if admin has responded because I may not get to it until the next day myself. or I, I personally go in and review. If you get a response, it's probably going to be from me, uh, although I have other case managers in there reviewing things as well. So just make sure you, you go back, generate a, a view of your previous reaction details so that you can make sure that you're not missing admin messages which are different from the mail messages because these are messages in response to the specific reaction. And if, you were on your, if you were on your screen, you'd actually see my mouse moving through the back office member panel right now illustrating this. That's why there's a big advantage in actually being on the screen. But go ahead, Louise. Okay, and um, I have a little question on the BX antitoxin, the injection. Uh, might it interfere with anything else that a person was taking before, like about 10 days before I had a knee injection? And I've been doing this for four years at Synvic. It's, it's to help, you know, the mobility in my knee. And uh, this time, uh, there's a pain in there like you wouldn't believe. Uh, and I thought, wow, the only thing that's different is the BX that I took, you know, maybe 10 days after the injection. Might yeah. the BX interfere with that? 
I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, view it as the BX interfering with the compound as much as I would the BX actually going into an area that may have a microbial component and resolving that. Uh, quite often, you're going to see the resolution of a multiplicity of, of conditions in addition to the cancer. Uh, people continuously are reporting the resolution of, of uh, high blood pressure. In fact, I tell people, be careful if you have high blood pressure and you're taking high blood pressure medication because the BX molecule will go in and literally break apart the microbes that may be behind the, the high blood pressure in terms of uh, the formation of atherosclerotic plaque and so forth. So I suspect that your anywhere you feel pain, maybe where the BX molecule is moving in and working on a microbial resolution in that area. So I would suspect that given the fact that you have pain in the knee, you may uh, see an improvement in that condition. I would just uh, look at that over time. Thank you very much. That's it for me. Okay. Uh, I don't see any specific uh, queries in the uh, text panel, so let's move on to who else is here for the first time? Elena. Elena, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Good, good. I'm calling in for Vladimir. Because, okay. Yeah, language good. barrier. You bet, you bet. Uh, how are things going and what specific questions do you have? Uh, things are going very well. Um, looking forward to the uh, to the video, I think that's going to cover half of half of the questions I have. Lots of questions. Um, <clears throat> feel feel free to ask them. Don't don't uh, you know that's what the purpose of this call is. So go okay. ahead. Okay, terrific. Uh, uh, Vladimir is going to be administering the uh, the injection himself. So his concern is, uh, well, he wanted to know the best place. Um, where he can reach, and uh, I mean, is it okay to do in, the, in maybe the arm or? Yeah, it, a lot of times if somebody is doing it um, themselves, the thigh, I mean, the the quadricep is a convenient place because you can sit down and literally do it in the muscle, the main muscle of the leg, the quadricep. Okay, muscle. quadricep muscle. So anything, oh. anything that's intramuscular, and generally when we look at, if, he, if he's wanting specific instructions there, we have two videos in, under the video tab of the back office that uh, are specifically instruction videos on intramuscular injections. Terrific. I have seen them. I will instruct him to, to view it and uh, see what he can get. <laughs> Hopefully he'll understand, but I will explain it as well, which is great. Thank you. Um, um, May I ask another question? Sure. Okay. Um, the dosage. He he did receive uh, the antitoxin and he did receive the uh, generator. Um, he's planning on starting uh, in about a week and uh, the first injection. And so he wanted to know um, the I, the amount. I guess is what is it called? The how yeah, how much? Well, well, the dosage. Um, the dosage, you, thank you. If you look under case management, okay. there's, a new, uh, there, there's ongoing developments there, but uh, the, uh, I'm not sure if that section's been put in yet. It's called first injection date. It uh, doesn't look like the new information has been put in there. And essentially, what we'll always do, we'll, unless otherwise notified, because we do review the cases, and sometimes you may recommend less than two cc's. In his case, the first injection will be two cc's. Two cc's. Terrific. Yeah, usually, usually, if we're going to tell you something else, it'll be uh, before, you, you know, uh, the day or the day after you actually register, uh, because we'll review the medical records, and then if we determine that there needs to be a, another dosage, we'll actually send you an email that says your first injection should be less than two cc's. But we'll, that'll be better explained uh, as, we, as we improve that first injection date and dosage uh, section. Okay, so I can go into case management. Yeah, you can go into case management, okay. right. But just know that the first one will be the, first one will be the uh, two cc's, and then following up on that, you really don't know, you know, when you get your baseline test on those four tests, then read through the case management, and that'll tell you 
how you're going to determine when you get your next injection. If, if none of those apply, you'll, you'll adhere to one of the default schedules listed on the bottom of the page. Okay, Other, otherwise, otherwise, he will follow the diagnostic indicators, and those will dictate uh, when he, uh, you know, administers, uh, you know, the additional object, uh, injections. Okay, understood. Uh, may I ask a question about the generator? You bet. Okay, uh, he put the, he put it together, and uh, his 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 concern is uh, when. When it's on uh, two per minute, uh, he does not um, uh, not he doesn't feel anything. Is it supposed to be that way? Uh, yeah, it's pretty hard to fill two liters. Uh, the best way for him to to verify that he has oxygen coming out is is it bubbling through the water in the bottle? Oh, great idea. Okay. If it's huh. bubbling through the water in the bottle and the the lid on the humidifier bottle is on tight, you should be able to, to pinch the two openings that come from the nasal cannula that go into the nose, pinch those to build up pressure in the bottle, put it close to the ear, and then release, uh, you know, and then release uh, the pinch on those two openings, and you'll hear kind of a, you know, you'll hear a pressure that releases, and you'll hear it in your air, in your ear. That'll uh, confirm that you have pressure and that you're getting oxygen to the okay, nose. But good. generally, generally, if it's bubbling through the bottle, you're getting it. Okay, terrific. Because when he increases to four or five, it is very um, prevalent. I mean, he does he feels it, but at two, he doesn't. And yeah, so and you're not you're not generally going to feel it at two. Got it. Terrific. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. All right. And, and then uh, who, who else was new for the first time? Uh, Sue from Atlanta. I'm new for coming in on the phone call, but not new to the BX injection. Right, right, Sue, of course. Uh, and how are you doing? Good. Uh, actually, for the first time after I guess it would be in my fourth shot, I finally got the uh, major reaction that you'd been looking for. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. uh, and, it, you know, it's a, more of a personal thing, so if you don't have going into it, but I did do the hyperbaric chamber, uh, which I know you had recommended, and I didn't know if it was coincidence that uh, after using the hyperbaric chambers that I was able to get, you know, full-blown um, symptoms, which I had not had you know, uh, previously, or if it was just the fact that I was due after um, injection four. I had one at the Hope, and then I've had three here at the house. Um, so anyhow, my symptoms basically occurred one week after uh, my fourth injection. Right, right. Uh, now, um, on your uh, on your reaction report, uh, I, I are you talking about? Was this around the seventh of May? Uh, no, this was just uh, like this past Monday. The uh, that I ended up uh, Monday, I guess the fourteenth. I had the BX on the seventh, and then starting the evening of the fourteenth, I had finally had the uh, the good reactions, the severe pain, the nausea. Right. Uh, all you know, of what, that. what I what I want to encourage is to make sure you're putting your reports in because I don't have any report after the 11th for you. Okay. So, Actually, I was doing that, and then uh, I couldn't get out of it in order to uh, call you to find the phone number. <laughs> oh, okay. So yeah. anyhow. Yeah. No, because I I do personally go in there and, and uh, study each and every reaction submitted by every member every day. Right. Okay. Uh, and so I'd love to be able to see those. Um, okay. And so, let, yeah, let's uh, maybe just as an illustrative point, um, this, this brings up a, a pretty important point scientifically. This is illustrative of the reason we use oxygen in the first place. Now, let, let me kind of explain. Without the oxygen, the BX molecule does not work. I, I hope you realize that. Um, without the use of the oxygen, when the bacterium's hydrogen is stripped off or when the dehydrogenation occurs, the end linkage wants to grab onto oxygen. So if there's not an abundance of molecular oxygen, um, then 
then, then it'll fizzle out. It'll be like starting a fire and having no wind or sticking a bucket over the fire. You're going to smother it because you're going to restrict oxygen to it. Very similar reaction, actually, uh, on, a, on a much smaller level, uh, but it, very, very similar. Uh, on some occasions, if somebody is not getting a reaction, it may be due to uh, an oxygen carrying capacity of the blood, even with the use of the oxygen that comes out of the concentrator, which is simply breathing in oxygen and, and, and increasing the saturation levels of oxygen, somebody may have an issue where they're not getting the delivery of oxygen at the cellular level. That could be based on um, the stickiness of the blood. Perhaps uh, it could be based on, you know, uh, in a, an inadequacy with the hemoglobin carrying capacity. So what you did was actually very smart, and I'm actually going to be covering that in the oxygen section that will be going up on, uh, on the FAQ portion here shortly, what you did is you went and, and took in molecular oxygen and put it under pressure, under pressure of one or two PSI, maybe three or four, depending on what they were doing. And because you put it under pressure, you're forcing it into the cell, and now the reaction is able to be optimized as a result. So the question, does hyperbaric oxygen would you recommend hyperbaric oxygen? Well, my response would be similar to the one that I just gave. Hyperbaric oxygen could represent an increase in the response and an improvement in the efficacy of the molecule because it is a O2 under pressure. Now we could move to a different form. Uh, and this is one thing that, we will, that we're working on right now is to have members uh, have access to a another little generator that uh, will come with your oxygen concentrator that is a long chain oxonide unit that simply um, uh, takes the O2 and puts it under high voltage and turns it into O8, O64, O3, these long chains that are highly reactive and they have a byproduct of O1. O1 is much more effective and reactive than O2. Uh, so we're working on some optimizations there. Stay tuned. But you bring up a really good uh, point that the use of hyperbaric oxygen certainly can enhance and accelerate uh, the, the molecule and the whole process of cascading. After you did that, did you have chills? No, I did not have any chills. But you had tight, I see that you had tightening. I've you were having had, a little tightening before, but what was the primary acceleration that you noticed? Uh, pain. Okay. Quite severe pain in the same area in the abdomen instead of the tightness, which I've always kind of maintained. Right. Uh, but this was, I meant, yeah, like stay up all night, <laughs> yeah, uh, what, which is great. I mean, I was, I was thrilled, to be quite honest. Yeah, because what you're, what you're experiencing is a rapid die-off because it's cascading fast, and the result of that is the liberation of the cellular material along with its acidic byproducts, the endotoxins, the malic, uh, lactic acid, and even alcohol compounds that are liberated uh, from a dying cancer cell, and that will cause a burning sensation. It's a burning pain, right? Uh, yeah, I would say burning pain, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, kind of a, a burning pain that's uh, characterized by sharp pin-like, you know, uh, uh, cycles, kind of where, where it just really you have a pin-like sharp pain and then it subsides and then boom, all of a sudden it comes again and kind of cycles. It will do that, but then there are also there are times of it just kind of being uh, constant and then all of a sudden you'd feel like what you want to call the stabbing. You yeah. know, area, but it was uh, fully concentrated against the entire abdomen, right side, left side, uh, which yeah. obviously is my issue. But I was quite pleased, um, you know, to have those and then ended up with some of the other uh, side effects, uh, which I had you not really some, had before. You should see some swelling. In the belly? You should see a little swelling anywhere in, in the malignant tissue. Yep. Yep. I do have a little, um, you know, a little belly uh, swelling. I'm not very big, but I can tell there's still a little bit there. Yeah, I mean that—that's what happens. Uh, the swelling 
you got to get swelling, and, and swelling is much different than growth. Malignant growth is an entirely different thing. What happens with the BX is it goes in and really turns everything into a pile of mush, and the result of that is uh, a change in density. That will cause swelling, but also the inflammatory process that results. What happens when a malignant structure liberates a bunch of waste product and, and it just dies out and turns into a pile of mush? Well, the immune system is very smart and it says, it says okay, we're going to recruit these cell-derived mediators. They come out of certain cells that increase the permeability of the blood vessels and blood will literally pour into that area for the purpose of bringing in the cell lines that are involved in the removal of the waste product. And that's where the swelling comes from. This is an inflammatory response to die off or accelerated uh, apoptosis, necrosis, uh, hemolysis. You know, all those terms are, are uh, terms that you should become familiar with and understand. Um, so that's exciting. That's good. That's oh, it, good was. it was. It was very good. And the only other question I have, since I did receive the new bottle of the new improved uh, BX, and looking at the default schedule, since I've already been on it, I don't necessarily start with two cc's. I probably just continue with the one cc. Yeah. And point, actually, you... I'm going to be getting blood work tomorrow for the first time, because uh, the hope they said, you know, wait on getting the blood work. So I'm actually going tomorrow to get some blood results. So, we, you know, I'll cover that with Andrea. Yeah, and, ha and have, you, uh, have you been into the case management link in the back office? No, I, can, I don't. I've just got an iPad, so I don't have that flash drive, I'm afraid. So yeah. I don't get into the back office. Oh, okay, yeah, that, that's really, really critical. Uh, you'll, maybe you'll be missing a lot of information if you don't. So try to get a PC or, or uh, try to figure out how to get into the back office at least – you know, if you have to go to the library, exactly. get in. Yeah, to, I can go to, to my to, children's to, house. Yeah. yeah, to at least read, because since since you started, we've actually implemented an entire diagnostic system for, for actually charting your improvement quantitatively. Yes, uh, Andrea emailed me that. Okay. So uh, that's why I'm getting blood work tomorrow with the, the SED rate and, uh, and all the others that I have not had since I was at the Hope Clinic. Oh, perfect. So I should, and so more than so. Once I get those results, then we can figure out uh, to go on the default schedule or start on the the new one. But even if with the blood the way it is, if it's needing it, uh, do I start then with the two CCs or do I? I guess I'll just have to look in the back office. No, no, you'll you'll start. Uh, you'll just start with the uh, with the one. Okay, that's what I had a feeling. Okay, all right, sounds good. And obviously, since I've been on it, I don't have to do a cleanse, right? I've been on the BX diet now for. Eight weeks, I don't need to do a cleanse. Yeah, you just stay on the maintenance exactly. portion of it. Yep, yeah. you're, you're, okay. you're, you're, you're fine. Okay. Uh, I'm throwing up onto the screen. There's a few uh, in the back office. This is just a, uh, a quick illustration of what you'll generally see. Uh, this is a three-month period where you can see a pretty substantial malignant structure um, uh, on, on the breast, okay, and the complete uh, uh, disintegration or digestion or decomposition of that malignant uh, structure over the next three months. You're always going to see this white pasty stuff in the process of reversal, and I want to comment on that because there are uh, most people that have an external tumor are going to see this. Anybody with a tumor will experience this. They just may not see it. Uh, that, there's a big difference between infection in liberated cellular material. And I'm, I'm, I've been explaining this to a few doctors that are uh, kind of interested bystanders who may have patients in this, and their patient goes in and they see, you know, what appears to be an infection when, in fact, it's not an infection. You can culture bacteria in anything. There's, a, you know, an infection is more, it has a different uh, density to the what we call pus, it's yellower and uh, it has more of a yellow hue to it. It's a completely different type of type of substance uh, than cellular material. What you're looking at here is liberated the contents of dead cancer cells. Okay, it's this white, pearly kind of uh, substance that is dead cancer cells. Okay, proteins, amino acids, fats, sugars nitrogenous waste, bacterial debris, and the like. 
uh, that's what you see here, and you will see that anytime you have an external tumor, you're pro it's probably going to open up, cavitate if it's large enough, and this is what you're going to see. So I uh, thought, thought that may be illustrative uh, and instructive for those of you that you do have external tumors, or even for those of you that have internal uh, tumors, this is what you're going to see. You're first going to see, and I don't actually have the ones in between, but you're, you're always going to see swelling before you see shrinkage. Okay, Here, obviously, it's completely gone all the way down to... Uh, uh, you know, essentially nothing. Uh, this this is a nipple structure, and so what what you'll see at the end stage. This is only three months into it. I usually say three to six months is your absorption period. This one was a little faster than that, uh, so probably three to six months will be more of the reconstructive period here. But you're going to actually see in the case where a nipple is involved, you'll you'll actually in the final analysis the the anatomical structure will be rebuilt. It has nothing to do with us. It's just what the body does. Uh, and so you'll, you will actually end up with a new structure or a repaired structure, and tissue will come in through, through the eight-step series of events that I explained under case management. If you've looked under case management, you'll see that. Um, and a new structure will come in. So I thought that would be interesting for you to very see. Very good. Okay, I think that's it, and I appreciate it, Dr. Smith, very much. You betcha. Uh, now, can I ask anyone, you one, oh. one question since you were talking about the hyperbaric? I did it after the BX. Dr. Curiel wondered about doing it five days prior to the injection. Uh, yeah, I'm working with the clinical affiliates right now. I'm implementing the use of free radical inducing uh, O1 or singlet or activated oxygen, uh, which is uh, actually a little more effective than hyperbaric. Okay. Uh, because it's O1 instead of O2, so it's 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 really has a higher degree of bioavailability, um, and and those are ongoing developments uh, that we're doing. You know, we have a lot of doctors doing little case studies and clinical trials in probably four different countries right now. Okay. Uh, so we as we gather the information, that's one of the reasons it's important to access the back office. If you don't access the back office, you probably will not. This is, as you, know, as, you've, as you have noticed, the back office is an evolution of information, so it changes quite rapidly, uh, and you want to make sure you're abreast of uh, recent developments or changes that, okay. that we're uh, providing. Wonderful. Thank you so much. You bet. I would recommend continuing with the hyperbaric, though, particularly before and during the cycle. So if okay. you're doing an injection, you want to do it, let's say, the day of, and maybe the day after and the day after and the day after. Now, you're going to have to find somebody that's willing to do it three days in a row. Oh, actually, um, my guy was willing to I did it four days in a row. Okay, well, you're lucky because sometimes uh, a, a hyperbaric uh, oxygen clinic may say, no, oh, we're, we're not, we're not going to do it because the guidelines would suggest uh, otherwise. Because um, yeah, he was very excited about, uh, uh, you know, the BX uh, antitoxin and was very familiar, you know, not familiar with that, but what the effects would be in order for, you know, increasing the, the blood supply. Yeah. yeah it, it's pretty stable. Uh, you know, this, this picture that I'm showing up on the screen, this is, you know, I would say 99% of the people are going to experience this. I mean, it, it, it used to be years ago where, you know, it, it's hit and miss getting the, the effect to occur and to spread. But now it's it's like uh, you know a, a high tech nuclear weapon, and, and generally we're going to get the increase in pain, the tightening, and then the swelling. And the swelling is followed by the decomposition, which brings us to this phase. And of course, I showed some uh, some other pictures um, uh, before. I don't know if all of you saw them. Let me just kind of show you what I mean by decomposition. We could say the melting of neoplastic tissue, just the complete melting away uh, of the tissue illustrated by this picture. Uh, if you don't have your big boy pull-ups on, you might want to get a pair of depends on for this one because this is pretty su substantial. That's um, that what we're talking about when we're talking about the same kind of effect, the white, gooey, you know, uh, 
stuff just completely falling apart. The swelling prior to decomposition is illustrated here, and in this case, the sequential decomposition of the malignant tissue, which is just this, this weeping willow of dead uh, uh, malignant material. Those of you that are not seeing this, uh, this is a tumor about the size of a watermelon uh, on someone's breast. So, um, I think that was on your original video. No, not no, not this one. That that, that, that one was uh, that one was small compared to this. Oh my gosh! Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that that one was really small compared to this one. Anyway, it's just uh, interesting to learn of the the science and uh, really understand. Uh, that if you go in with a structure that looks like that, what do you think somebody's going to say? And I'll, I'll ask Kathy. What do you think, Kathy? Can you hear me? Yeah. If you if, if you if you go into the doctor with a structure that looks like that, what do you think he's going to say? An untrained oncologist, as an example. He's going to operate. <laughs> he's going to want to operate, um, but in disease. Yeah, he's going to say you have a flesh eating you have a flesh eating bacteria. Let's call the CDC. <laughs> That's what he's going to say. Or he's going to say you have a bacterial infection. Uh, or he's going to be highly confused uh, because this is not the type of you know. This he may say you have a fungoid cancer. There are a variety of responses that come from somebody that's untrained in uh, oxidative or mitochondrial dysfunction related to cancer because they're not looking at it that way at all. Um, so that gets kind of humorous uh, when people go into their oncologist. And, and generally, our members know much more than their oncologist about the reversal of disease from the standpoint of micro, my, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, microbial causation, uh, you know, the uh, removal of the microbe and the forthcoming uh, decomposition of, uh, of uh, malignant tissue, it, it, you, you have a much better grasp on it than your oncologist. So don't underestimate yourself. Uh, as, as Coke and Glover and Reif used to say in the old days, back in the 30s when they actually had this figured out, um, the patient is the best physician. And that is certainly the case uh, when, it, when you are now required in self-administration capacity to become your own physician. Well, <laughs> you know, if not you, who? Exactly um, right. So, um, Kathy, can you, can you hear now and can you be heard? I don't, uh, can you hear me? I can, yeah, I can hear, hear Kathy. I, yeah. Yep, we can hear you just fine. Oh, can you? Okay, good. Okay, good. Yeah, I was just wondering about the. I guess I I see now the um, uh, the schedule, like the the example schedules. Should we actually wait until our blood starts going back up, or should we follow the schedule? Like my uh, my blood numbers went down a little bit. Like the one number was thirteen down to eleven, or something like that. Like yeah, it, it moved a little bit, but not much. Yeah, well, you're at the very low end of the sed rate. It doesn't become, uh, you know, when you're that far down, you don't have, there's not much more going down uh, because you're at the low end of your reference range. Uh, uh, so you really what you want to do is if you don't have a sed rate to work with or, or, or if you have a sed rate that has moved, you probably don't want to do another injection until it goes up a little. Okay. Uh, you know, yeah. it, it becomes a little less uh, meaningful the lower it is. Like somebody that has a sed rate that's five and it goes to three, uh, it just means that that you probably don't need another injection until it starts going up because the sed rate usually is going to rise if you have any malignancy going on. Yeah, I had a, a weird thing. Like when I went down, I had, well, it's almost like I wish as soon as you decide to join um, – the program, you should immediately go, go get those blood tests because yeah. I was doing a bunch of stuff before, and when I went down, they took an X-ray, and then they couldn't find the tumor. But it was just an X-ray, so I don't know if the X-ray was tricky and it was hiding somewhere or whatever. But they they said they couldn't see the tumor on the X-ray, so I don't know if some of the stuff I was doing leading up to it, it had had some effect or what. Yeah, it's it's hard to say, uh, but the imaging doesn't become 
really relevant until you until you know I wouldn't I wouldn't really worry about that from for three to six months, particularly if you can palpate and fill the tumor. Um, just because uh, it, it's a long-term requirement to get absorption because you get the swelling first. The, not, the malignancy actually goes away probably in the first 30 days. Usually on a structure like the one that I showed you on the screen, if we take a biopsy of that, we don't see any metastasis in it. We don't, all we see is, uh, you know, it's a, new, it's a mesenchymal tissue. So you really have to, to grasp the concept that a, a tumor that swells and is still there just because it's still there doesn't mean it's malignant. It, it actually converts into an angioblastic mechanism for removing the waste product. It's a different type of tissue. And you'll often hear oncologists, I have people that go into their oncologist, and uh, I had a guy recently uh, that went in, had a tumor on the back, and the oncologist is filling it with his hand, just kind of scratching his head, has this dismayed look, and, and says, this is strange. This is where your tumor was, but it's just kind of a fluid sac now. Oh, don't worry about that. I'll lance that for you and drain it. Drain it. So he goes and he gets the lance and he lances it, and his eyes get really wide, and he says, wait a minute, this is tissue. I don't know what kind of tissue it is, but it's tissue. Puts a Band-Aid on and sends them home. <laughs> oh, my so, goodness. Oh, no. So you have to realize that this is a very, very different, this is not something typical that an oncologist is, or a histologist for that matter is, is used to looking at uh, because it is, it, that's why they'll say things like you have a flesh-eating bacteria or a bacterial infection or, or uh, you know, at some point they may call it tumor lysis syndrome. But then they're really confused because you didn't do any chemo. Why would you have tumor lysis syndrome? You know, so there's a, there's a lot of different uh, things that come into play with respect to the change in tissue and, and the need for imaging. I wouldn't worry about imaging until it's gone uh, because you don't need okay. your radiologist to tell you that something's still there. Now, in your case, you can't see it, uh, so you want to you want to go by whatever di other diagnostics you have, like a marker, a sed rate, which you have is low, uh, perhaps LDH, if the LDH elevates a little, I believe yours did. Yeah. Uh, Everything went up and down like it's supposed to, but but not by much. And my numbers weren't that high to begin with. Yeah. So if you see it elevate a little, it's usually a sign that you're having some die-off because the elevation of the LDH is the liberation of the lactate dehydrogenase enzyme, which which comes and begins to manifest itself more abundantly when the tumor begins to break down or go into a state of hemolysis. So that's why we use the LDH uh, marker, just to signal, just to just to kind of confirm that we had an impact. So we say we did the injection, we get tightening, a little bit of swelling, an increase in pain, and our LDH went up. Now we have a pretty good indication that we're running with a negative cycle and that we're, you know, that we have a trajectory that's been put in place. Okay. Is, is um, hyperbaric chambers safe for people with lung cancer? Uh, you will have, not, not always. Um, it depends on uh, the amount of malignant tissue and where it is in the pleural lining. Uh, and any issues of pleurisy or fluid retention. And so you'll just have to consult. You know, the guys that do that are experts in the use of hyperbaric oxygen, so they'll be able to okay. tell you whether it's indicated or not. It certainly yeah, isn't indicated. In, in brain cancer, you sure, certainly wouldn't do it. Okay. Yeah, but in, in lung, yeah, that's a sensitive tissue, but quite often, you know, uh, hyperbaric's just fine with, uh, with the pleural lining. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna respond to a question Louise had. What what happens to tumors that are more in, in interior? How do you get how do they get eliminated? So when we have uh, if we could perceive an advantage of having an external tumor, we would say that the advantage is you get when it decomposes, you get some stuff that just sloughs sloughs off externally. With this big tumor, it's a good thing that's not completely internal because what happens if she has to internally deal with all that waste product. Well, you're going to have a, a, a greater Herxheimer reaction, and you're going to have more debris 
that the blood, kidneys, and liver has to clean up. So you're talking about the answer to your question is white blood cell activity, phagocytic activity, where the white blood cells come in. You may see a little rise in monocytes because they differentiate into macrophages, which are the cell lines that will come in and start to chew this stuff up and eat it up and golf in golf particles, and, and it's a process called phagocytosis, right? Uh, so some of that uh, may be broken down by enzymatic activity. Uh, uh, protease, for example, is an enzyme that digests protein. That's one of the reasons why somebody has a lot of cancer. We say, listen, stay away from animal proteins, and please don't worry about protein intake. If you're eating, if you're eating vegetables and fruits and grains, you're getting plenty of protein. I mean, most grains are 14 to 17% content protein by weight um, and so you're getting plenty of protein and you don't you don't need any more protein when you have a lot of malignant tissue because when it decomposes there's a lot of food stuff going into the system and so yeah enzymatic activity white blood cell activity uh, the normal uh, breakdown process process of the liver and the kidney uh, some of the other ways that the body will use to excrete this waste product is through excretion uh, mechanisms such as sweat. So the integumentary itself will, will attempt to relieve the body of, the, of this debris through kicking in, a, a, you know, where you get the chills and the sweats that set in. That's why it's listed on the drop-down menu, increased uh, frequent urination, diarrhea, uh, vomiting, these are all mucus secretions, uh, these are all ways that the body uses to, to get rid of the debris that is internally when you don't have the benefit of an external tumor where part of it is actually falling onto the floor, uh, relieving the system of the requirement, um, the body has its way of cleaning that up. Does that answer your question, Louise? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, and I think, uh, let me see, um, yeah, I think that was all the questions there. Does anybody else have a, a question that we need to address? We have nine minutes left on the call. Dwayne, I did see something. Okay, can I go? Sure. Okay. Um, I just picked up my results from my blood test, and I see that my, uh, you know, my cancer marker has gone up a little bit. My SED rate's the same, and my LDH has almost doubled. Okay. Well, I was going to put well, that in as soon as I get out, out of the uh, conference there, but my yeah, my LDH went from uh, 144 to a 204. Okay, let me explain that. It's very simple to explain. Uh, when the LDH, when you have a sharp rise in the LDH, often t that that is a uh, that is our indicator, our diagnostic measure of hemolysis or the breakdown of the tumor. Now, the question, why would my cancer marker go up? Well, because you are liberating the surface, the adhesion proteins of those cell lines in a manner that's creating what we call a marker flare. Now, if yours went up just a little, you know, that's, that's very common. That's why in chemotherapy, the oncologist, you know, somebody will say, well, what about my marker? And you say, well, don't worry about your marker for 60 days because you see kind of a similar thing in chemo. Um, you know, they'll use chemo and they will get an effect on the tumor, obviously, otherwise it, it, it wouldn't, they wouldn't have a business, right? So they get, they'll get shrinkage or destruction, uh, cytotoxic destruction of the tissue, and the result of that will be the liberation of those adhesion proteins that we call a marker. Um, and they will often flare or spike, as it's called, a, a tumor marker flare. And so when you see a rise in the LDH and a rise in the marker, what you're seeing is a marker flare, but you're using the LDH to confirm that you have the breakdown or the destruction of the malignant tissue. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. Sounds good. Yeah, so now what you'll do is you'll just wait and follow the SED. Your SED's at what? My SED's at uh, one, 16, 16. Was it 16 six months ago? Still at 16. Still at 16. So 16 is at the low end of the reference range. Uh, it gives you a nice place to kind of sit. As long as you know your LDH is going up, now what you'll notice is at some point your LDH will go down. Because when we... When we go into accelerated apoptosis or cell death, the LDH is going to go up. Um, usually it's going to go up, and not always, but sometimes it'll go, I would say 90% of the time, 
no, let's say 80% of the time it's going to rise and then it'll fall. It'll rise and fall. Uh, the same with a marker, rise and fall. But ultimately, all the numbers should be in the reference range. They should all fall. But that doesn't necessarily mean they fall right away. Sometimes they rise and fall. So it's, it's important to, to understand the distinction. Thank you. You betcha. Uh, other questions? I have one question, uh, Sue. Uh, when you were talking about uh, the x-ray and diagnostic tools, whether it's um, uh, ultrasounds or whatever, when the tumor before showed as a tumor, and then now it may just show, like you were saying, as the uh, white pearly dead cancer cells, well, uh -huh. um, that's when uh, you have to trust in your uh, radiologist and your, uh, your oncologist not to... Um, jump the gun and say, oh, my gosh, you've got another one coming back. Uh, let me stop you right there. You will never, mm, I, I, better, I better modify the statement, you will rarely find an oncologist or radiologist that will not say that your cancer is growing. In fact, I've had them tell people their cancer is growing before they review the radiology. Oh, perfect. <laughs> well, in, other, in, in, in other words, They've been doing this for a long time. They've had 10,000 people walk through their door. They know what their cell line is. They say, oh, this is a squamous cell carcinoma. We have a 56 day or a 62 day doubling time of that cell line. They, you walk into their office, you go, hi, my name's uh, Mr. So and so. I'm your oncologist. Your cancer's growing. Exactly. They're, they're not going to, they're not going to tell you. If they have a structure there that, that's yielding a contrast on an image, they're going to tell you it's growing unless you're getting somebody that's actually being trained by one of our clinical affiliates. For example, when I went in to train uh, the staff at Hope for Cancer, you know, these are people that are, you know, this is an open-minded, completely different mindset. So now the radiologist, which is, you know, has 30 years of, of experience at Hope for Cancer, he's saying, okay, I understand, so we're looking for density changes. We're looking for necrotic factors. We may be looking for the reduction in arterial supply, but an increase in the venous supply. In other words, what happens here is the blood comes in, it swells, and new veins appear. Big difference than new arteries, right? Right. Uh, because veins are meant to remove the debris, and you'll always see vascular ingrowth, but it'll be on the venous side, not the arterial side. So a radiologist like that, well, he's approaching it completely different. A radiologist that you're going to, utilizing a local resource, has 50 reports stacked on his desk, and he's going through them one at a time, copying and pasting them, in most cases, you know, to a report. I've actually seen uh, radiologists that were, it, it says no change, no change, no change. Um, you'll quite often see that. That's, that's a, uh, an image mill. We call it an image mill where the reports are coming through so fast, these guys are just pumping them out, boom, 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 boom. That's not always the case. You'll get some that will actually provide, you know, say there's an increase from 6 centimeters to 8 centimeters, that's all you're going to get. You're not going to get any qualitative interpretation on an imaging. That's why I say imaging doesn't uh, become too applicable until the tumor's already gone. Now, what happens when the tumor's gone and you go in? Uh, a variety of things. Uh, sometimes shock. Uh, sometimes <laughs> they refer to this as spontaneous reversal or medical miracle. You'll see that in the report. Um, sometimes they will not comment on it, just, complete, just will not comment on it. For example, I had a guy recently had liver cancer, um, I don't know, I think he has six lesions or had six lesions. And so because the process is sequential, not everything's affected at the same time, he goes in and uh, on the radio, on the uh, on the report, uh, it comments on three lesions, but doesn't comment on the other three. Well, come to find out, the other three weren't there. <laughs> Instead of saying they were gone, he just didn't comment on them. Yeah. So, doctor, so, I wanted to ask you: Are these things recorded that I could make my husband listen to this after? Say that again. 
Are these conferences recorded? Yeah. That yeah we're, I, 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 am, I, am report, I am starting to record the conferences, and we will make them available in the back office, probably under um, uh, archived uh, webcast. There will be a new link that we're putting up that will be called archived webcast recordings. And so we'll take these audio recordings and we'll make them available. And as we move forward, obviously, there'll be 50 or 100 of them up there. Uh, so uh, I think that's going to be a tremendous resource. But yes, this call is being recorded. Okay, good. For quality assurance. Because <laughs> <laughs> if I don't do a good job, they're going to fire me here. Yeah, right. <laughs> So, well, thank you about the uh, you know the ultrasound information because I'm actually going to be receiving my first one on Tuesday after coming back from the Hope, and I just know that they're going to look and say, "Oh my goodness, look at this! You've got increased activity. You've got this, this, and this." So at least I'll be um, a little calmer going in when I uh, meet with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me let me really emphasize this point and drive this home because one of the disadvantages uh, that you have on a program like this, I mean, the advantage is, is that we're committed for the one year. This is a long-term requirement. If we could do it in 30 days, believe me, we'd do it in 30 days. It would be a lot better for us just to have a 30-day program. But there's a long-term commitment, but this is a virtual medical culture. This is a self-administration, educationally-based model, and so you become the person pulling your own little red wagon medically. And, and the disadvantage is, is that you are a Obliged to access local medical resources that, that are not educated in the BX protocol, nor in the idea that cancer is even caused by microbes. So you're at a huge disadvantage there, and just so that you know, you will always go into your oncologist and have him tell you that you are dying and are going to die. I had somebody yesterday that came home in, in tears, uh, you know, submitting the report saying, yeah, I just went in, uh, this is because oftentimes you're going to have to go in for medical uh, uh, emergency intervention. That's what they're good at, by the way. Uh, this example is lung cancer stage four. What happens when the thing breaks apart and goes into a pile of mush? You're going to get the liberation, all that stuff, and the floral lining. It's going to, uh, you, you have... Uh, when you have a lot of cancer, you're going to have a lot of die-off in the blood. Uh, you're going to have a huge amount of debris to deal with. You're going to get fluid retention, swelling potentially, and lymphatic, lymphatic congestion uh, resulting in something that appears to be like lymphedema where the arms and legs may swell. This is a temporary function in the recovery cycle. And so in the case of somebody that has, you know, a tumor, uh, or metastasis in three organs, a lot of it, they're always going to get fluid. Some of, that, some of that could be a buildup of fluid in the lungs and a condition of pleurisy where they have to go and actually get a procedure to drain that and manage that fluid. Uh, sometimes if somebody has, uh, quite often when somebody has uh, liver cancer, they have cancer in the A sites, which are the little tubes that drain the interstitial fluid out of the abdomen. They're going to get a, I can guarantee it, that's going to swell. They're going to get potentially a buildup of interstitial fluid, and they're going to have to go in and get that managed and drained. That's a very common procedure, by the way. Um, and so what happens when you go in and you have fluid in the lungs? Well, like this lady yesterday, she went in, and here's somebody that's had, uh, has an external breast tumor, that is completely gone, fully decomposed. That, I mean, it, it, no explanation there. They look at that, scratch their head, put a bandage over it, don't even comment. But then turn around and tell you, you know, you have 30 days to live. You should get your affairs in order. So it's important that you have an expectation. They said, well, actually, they, they said, uh, he, he said, you have three months to live with chemo and 30 days to live without it. You've got to get the chemo. That's what he told her. <laughs> and she said, hmm, let me see, 30, three months, 30 days, what's the difference? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Why would, I, why would I do the chemo? So, so that you're always going to get the death response from the Grim Reaper Society. And so as long as you have the proper expectations and understanding of how to utilize your local medical resources, you'll be in good shape. But don't run into your oncologist expecting them to give you a big pep talk and say, hey, you can do it. You're going you're gonna to beat this. You're going to get through it. Never going to happen, folks. Yeah. So make, oh, yeah. sure that you, make sure that mentally you understand 
what you're utilizing your local medical resource for. I encourage you to find a alternative medical doctor who is open-minded, who is a general practitioner, not an oncologist. Make sure that's who you're using. You're going to be miles ahead uh, as opposed to using an oncologist. Right. I actually have both, but I have a uh, port that uh, I actually have to go to the oncologist to get flushed. So while right. I'm flushing it, I'm going to have my blood work done and an ultrasound. Absolutely. Sometimes you have to use the oncologist because, you, you know, the, the way the system's set up, that they're billing your insurance, they're going to require that you see a specific type of specialist if it uh, relates to a procedure that fits within that billing criteria. So just make sure that you mentally that you're strong. Don't exactly. expect to go into your oncologist. I mean, it's amazing. People will go into their oncologist and the entire staff will hover around them saying, you're dying, you're dying. I mean, it's just like you, you be, you, you're almost uh, expecting to come in with some kind of grim reaper black hood on. Um, it's just uh, it's just mind-boggling, the mentality. Uh, you know, the, the oncologist yesterday is just, Pounding, you know, pounding her, saying, "Listen, I've been doing this for years. I know you're going to die. It's not a question of." She's saying, "Listen, I'm trying some alternative thing. I think it's working." And and, and he says, "Listen, don't be crazy. You're going to die. That's guaranteed. It's a foregone conclusion. It's a mathematical certainty." He told her. <laughs> so pretty, pretty strong language language coming from very intelligent, influential people. Exactly. Uh, who, who we tend to want to vest confidence in. Just be careful. Be aware. Recognize you're your you're your own physician, and you know a lot more about the reversal of pathology than your oncologist. Correct. Okay. Well, you've just reaffirmed it, and uh, it's going to make my appointment much easier. Thank you so much. You bet, you guys. Use them for what they're good at, because what they are good at is uh, medical intervention. Uh, emergency procedures, they are very good at that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, tap into what they're good at. Uh, they're, they're tremendous. You know, if I have a broken bone, I'm going to an orthopedic surgeon, man. These guys are good. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, Dr. Smith, I do have one question. This is Raquel, and I'm a, care I'm a caregiver for my mom, Maria Schwest. Um, she has a uh, nephrostomy tube that needs to be replaced, and with that, we're going to give her um, local, or I think general anesthesia to replace it. Now, is any, is the anesthesia okay while, you know, she's on the BX? Will it interfere with the BX? It will interfere, and yes, it is okay. Okay. It will interfere, but you don't have an option there. Right. So what you do is you go in, you let it interfere, you come home and you readminister the, the thing, right? It's particularly anesthesia. Anesthesia is actually more interfering than narcotics. Okay. Uh, uh, but, but it doesn't matter. You, you have to do it. You don't have any choice. You're going in, you're yeah. getting anesthesia, you're going to come back, you're going to, you're going to let it pass out of your system for 24 hours and you're going to readminister. Okay. <clears throat> Sounds good. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, uh, Dr. Franco calling. Hey, Franco. Um, your uh, back office email system, is that uh, go to delta at gmail.com? No, that would be the back office um, system that is when you go to go to delta.com, you'll see, you'll see a login. Right. Okay. And when you click login and put your username and password in there, if you do not, uh, you, you should have a username and password because that comes out as an automated response to your registration form and with the explanation of going into the back office, watching the videos, attending the web, webcast like you're doing now. Um, you may want to re-reference that email, or if for some reason you've misplaced it, you can send a uh, request to go to delta at gmail.com, and we will resend that email with your username and password with instructions on how to access the back office. Very critical that you access the back office. That's where it happens. Yeah, well, yeah. So I'm in the back office, but uh, I just didn't couldn't find where I where I could email uh, something. Do you see Do you see a link called mail? Yes. 
Yeah, if you see a link called mail, click on that link, and that's where you email. Okay, and then uh, what? I just uh, click on compose. I I see a list here of a bunch of uh, things, but uh, where do I write the email? Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, where you write the email is um, I'm just going to go into it real quick. Do you see on the left hand side it says I now it says compose mail. Compose mail. Yeah. You just click on that. Then you, then you type your text into the box down below, and then you push submit. Okay, because I, I just I'm going to be uh, doing the injection uh, this Saturday, and this week I've been on on the diet, and uh, I just uh, there's a few uh, things like yeah on the I, uh, on those, that I'm on and all that that I want to clarify. Yeah, on those questions, just submit them in the back office, and uh, I personally will respond to them. And we do that uh, do it up to two or three times a day, seven days a week. So uh, we want to make sure you have access to that. Thank you so much. You bet you, Franco. Talk to you real soon. Uh, any other questions before we, uh, we've gone over a little on the call, but I think it's been a productive call? Any other questions? You answered lots of, uh, of questions that actually, like you said at the beginning, that pertain to all of us. Yep. Yep, you bet. I think this is this very, very critical information that we're covering. So with that said, I will end the call, and we will look forward to uh, talking with you real soon, folks. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for taking the time. You bet. Talk to you soon. God okay. bless. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.